morning, everyone. As we thank you. As we make our way in, uh, if you have your hymnal, uh, we're going to turn to page four hundred and forty-one. Page four forty-one. This is the prelude Sunday to Thanksgiving. Amen. Okay. So our song this morning is entitled Greatest Thy Faithfulness. We're going to sing all three verses of the song, and then we'll be getting to our lesson this morning. Okay, uh, let's sing it together. Page 441, Greatest Thy Faithfulness. On the first, on the first. Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have need, that thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Let's do the last, on the last. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth. Thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with ten thousands beside. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. I have needed thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Amen. Well, it's good to see everybody out this morning. And uh, I know uh, that uh, it's it's uh, one of those days where you look outdoors and you, you see a drab day and then obviously along with the, the drabness sometimes it, it affects your your uh, your spirit sometimes it affects your voice amen and uh, and so uh, we just obviously have to just uh, uh, go with the flow go with the flow I want you to take your Bible and turn with me to uh, once again to our reference text Galatians chapter 5 verse 22. Galatians 5.22. We're going to learn uh, something uh, pretty unique today as we, we continue our study in, in the, uh, the fruit of the Spirit. And we're going to be looking at the next one uh, here in, in verse, 20, verse number 22. Galatians 5.22. Paul says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness. Hey, today we're gonna we're gonna be looking at this this uh, this word goodness, and and while we when we look at it here, uh, just on the surface, we, we often think about uh, good deeds and 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 doing good, and and we're gonna look at that. In fact, the Lord uh, uh, did that, and and but but that word it actually has another meaning to it as well. So we're going to be looking at that additional meaning to this particular word. So first of all, I want you to turn to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter number 10. In, in Acts, it, it actually, um, it kind of touches on what, um, what the Lord uh, did when he, when he walked among 
uh, his people. Here in, in Acts chapter 10, and uh, look, at, look at verse number 38. Verse 38. The Bible says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. And then it says, Who went about doing good, and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. For God was with him. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you, God, for this time that we have. And, and, and Lord, as we, we touch on this, this, this word goodness, uh, Father, we ask, Lord, that you would help us to get another um, a general idea of, of what the word actually means and and God, how essential, God, it is for us as people of faith, men who study the Bible uh, to grasp the meaning of, of this word goodness. And, and we thank you, Lord, for what will be accomplished over the next few minutes. We praise your name, Lord, that we can meet today. And uh, Lord, as we have the prelude to Thanksgiving, we, we praise your name, God, that we have much to be thankful for. Bless now the time we have in Jesus' name. Amen. You'll notice in, in this particular text here, this is, this is actually in verse 38 of, of Acts chapter 10. This is one of those passages that, that in, in, in my, um, uh, I don't want to say, in, in, in my calling, uh, when I encounter other preachers and I've heard other sermons, sometimes they, they go to this particular text, uh, particularly when we think in terms of the Old Testament. And, and one of the reasons why they go to this text is because it, it actually talks about some of the accomplishments that Jesus was able to fulfill, the things he was able to do uh, in his tenure here on this side of eternity. And I want you to look at it again. He says, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost, with power. And then it says, who went out or who went about doing good and healing all manner, um, uh, all manner healing all that were oppressed with the devils, for God was with him. Usually when we think of Jesus, we oftentimes think of uh, how he had power to heal the sick. Uh, obviously, no one uh, in our day could do that. It, I, don't, I don't follow uh, that name it, claim it crowd, that, uh, that crowd that says that a man has the ability to heal someone of their sickness. I, I believe that uh, during the, 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 the Bible, the New Testament, as well as the Old Testament, God had in, endued men with, with that ability uh, to heal people. And, and the reason for that was so that, that people would understand that God was working through this individual. And in the New Testament, they were gifted to, to have that ability so that people might see that uh, this is opening the door for the, uh, for the, 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 the uh, institution of the local New Testament church. You see, in order, if you read the New Testament, you'll find out after Jesus went to heaven that he gifted those apostles to do some amazing things. And this was, again, the, the goal was to establish the local New Testament church. And, and obviously, we, we have uh, reaped that, that benefit because of those those miracles that were those miracles were not given to them so that they can puff themselves up and and draw attention to themselves it was it was they were given so that they can let people know that these men were truly of the lord but when we think of of jesus we think about how he had the ability to heal but he also had the ability to raise the dead now now uh, that was phenomenal and because of that we often overlook the statement that's made in this particular verse here. And it says this, it says, who went about doing good, who went about doing good. Uh, you know, I think that because of the phenomenal power that Jesus had, we have to remember that going about doing good is also, it also takes the power of God to do that. And we understand, of course, when we think in terms of good, we have our definition of what good is, but, but the Bible has another definition, and we're going to look at that here shortly. You know, when I read the Bible, I read about a man by the name of Moses who tried to do good uh, in his flesh. I want you to turn with me to Exodus chapter 2. 
Exodus chapter 2, we understand, and you may be guilty of this. I know I am guilty of this. Uh, at times we try to do things that in our mind might be a good thing. And then sometimes in our effort to try to do good, we sometimes mess up. And, and, and why is that? Well, it, it could be because it takes the Holy Spirit in us for us to have this discernment on, on how to do good. I want you to notice here in chapter 2, look at verse number 11 through 14. I'm just going to read these and make a comment. Uh, and, and so verse number 11, it says, And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, that he went out unto his brethren, and he looked on, his, on their burdens. And he spied an Egyptian smiting in Hebrew, one of his brethren. And he looked this way and that way, and when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and, and hid him in the sand. Now, I want to stop there and say this. Some would say, well, Moses had a right to slay that Egyptian because of what he did to that Hebrew. Now, obviously, we understand that, no, he, Moses didn't have the right to do that. Okay? But Moses thought what he was doing was an honorable thing. You know, he was protecting a fellow brother. He was doing his part to make sure uh, that uh, the, the, the individual who had the wrong done to him uh, would be able to be vindicated by the actions of Moses. Look at verse 13. It says, and when he went out the, the second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews strolled together. And he said unto them that did the wrong or him that did the wrong, wherefore smitest thou this fellow? And then, of course, he said, that is the fellow that Moses was talking to, who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me as thou killest the Egyptian? Then the Bible says, and Moses feared and said, surely this thing is known. So we see here that now Moses, of course, Moses, I am sure, assumed that his actions the day before not only was justified, but the response that he would receive from people who perhaps either observed what he did or heard about what he did, he perhaps assumed that they would commend him and say that what you did, Moses, was an honorable thing in taking that Egyptian's life. Well, we know that that wasn't an honorable thing, and we know that at this point Moses realized it. And why did Moses do that? Why did Moses take that Egyptian's life? Because Moses, he was trying to do, quote, unquote, good in the flesh in the flesh. And, and I believe sometimes in our effort to try to do good, we need to make sure that we are led of the Holy Spirit in our actions. Now, the word good or goodness, it, it actually speaks of living a life of integrity, a life of integrity. And, and honestly, you know, uh, when we think of the word good and integrity, we don't often compare the two together or put the two together. But in the New Testament, that word good, it speaks of, a, of one who, when the Bible says, and, 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 and Jesus did all things good. In other words, Jesus walked in integrity. He was, he was one that, that understood the, the, the need of being a person that would not only do what he, what he says he's going to do, uh, but, but then follow through on that in the eyes of others. Job, in Job chapter 31, verse 6, Job said this, Job said, let me be weighed in an even balance that God may know mine integrity. That God may know mine integrity. In, in our society today, uh, we have what I call a credibility gap. A credibility gap. And, and, and when I say that, that what, what is a credibility gap? We, we have a gap where we have people who say one thing and they do the other. They do the opposite. You know, one of the things when my kids were younger, when they were growing up in the house, and I said, well, well, Kevin, I'd say, Melissa, you need to clean your room up. And then after a certain period of time, when I came home from work and I saw that they didn't clean their room up and I would confront them, I'd say, why didn't you clean your room up? And they would come up with every excuse under the sun. Now, some of those excuses made sense. Well, mom wanted me to wash the dishes or, or I, I needed to uh, get my homework. You know, those were good excuses, but that was not what I asked them to do. 
And, and so we, we have a society that's like that today, a society that has a credibility gap. In business, a person may say that I want to be more honest when it comes to making a deal or closing a sale. And they, but yet they say anything to do that, to get the job done. In church, a Christian may say that I want to serve the Lord. But when it's time to serve the Lord, we don't show up to serve the Lord. In our family devotion time, when we're at home with our family and we say, you know, I want to start family devotions. And we set a time. And then when the time comes to do the devotion, we find other things to do, such as family video night or such as going to the park or such as, uh, uh, you know, going on a drive in the county or something. Now, those are good things, but that's not devotion time. Amen. You see, we have today, we have a credibility gap in our society. And, and so Paul, when he states uh, there, he talks about in the fruit of the spirit is goodness. He's not just talking about doing good, but he's talking about this thing of integrity, being honest before each other. Now, I want to make a couple of statements here. And, and then I, I want to show you and, and I want to close and give you the benefits of being a person of integrity, the benefits of being a person of. And by the way, uh, this is this is something that the Bible says it is a fruit of the spirit. We need to be people who are known not only for our words, but known for our actions and our deeds. Amen. So, number one, we must realize that our inability to produce this fruit is, is something that, that we can't do on our own, okay? Uh, we cannot produce this fruit on our own. And, and why is that? It's because we, uh, we, we're, we're fleshly people, we're human. I, I want you to go to Romans chapter seven, Romans chapter seven. I think if you were to be honest with me and if I were to be honest with you, there has been times in my life where I have not been a man of integrity. I have not followed through appropriately on what I said I was going to do. Has that happened to you? And, and, and I, I think that we, we need to, to remember if, we're, if we claim to be Christians, then, then this ought to be one of our trademarks. We ought to be people of integrity. Here in Romans chapter 7, look at verse 18. Paul says, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no, and notice he says, good thing, no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. And we understand Paul was, was obviously, he was filled with the spirit. He was a man uh, that was given over to writing much of the New Testament. But even Paul would have to admit, you know, there are some times I didn't do what I was supposed to do. There are times when, you know, I wanted to do good. I wanted to be a person of integrity, but I fell short. And he, he understood, though, if, if that was going to happen, it would happen because of the Holy Spirit. You know, everything that Moses, and I'm just going back to Moses and how we read about Moses and how he slayed that Egyptian. Everything that Moses did before the burning bush was on Moses. But after he had that encounter there at the burning bush, from that point on, it was no longer up to Moses. It was up to God. But remember, Moses still had to yield himself over to the Lord in order for the Lord to work through him. You see, we must realize our own inability to produce God's goodness. Number two, we must rely on the Holy Spirit if we are to see goodness or integrity produce in our life. Don't take it for granted that you're going to be a person of honesty. When you go to your job and you encounter people, you know, it's, that's where it really pays for us to exercise this gift of integrity in the eyes of those that we work with. Why is that? Because they are looking at us. They're paying close attention to us, whether we know it or not. You see, we must start out each day of our life by saying, Lord, 
Only by the Holy Spirit do I have power to do something big for you. Help me to get out of the way so that you can work through me for your eternal good. For your eternal good. And what are we talking about? The spirit of goodness. Goodness. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, that foundational text. It says, for it is God which worketh in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God wants to work through us. He wants us to be people, men of integrity. Of course, if this is, is if there's anything that, that, that's good in us, if it comes out of us, it's, it's got to be because of the Lord. So number one, I said, we must realize our inability to produce this fruit on our own. Number two, I said, we must rely on the Holy Spirit if we are going to see goodness or integrity produced in our life. Number three, how does the Holy Spirit reveal this goodness in us or this integrity in us? And I have three ways this happens. Three ways. Number one, uh, he reveals it. His goodness is, is developed in us, obviously, by the word of God, by the word of God. You see, if 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 you would have good fruit, you must have good seed. And that seed is the incorruptible seed of the word of God, which, of course, God gives to us when we accept him as our own. If you would have good fruit, you must have Good seed. Now, uh, without the seed, without the word of God, there is no ability to know what is good. But we can know what is bad because of our old nature. I want you to turn with me to Micah uh, chapter number six, Micah chapter number six. And, and remember, we're talking about the, the fruit of the spirit is goodness or integrity, the fruit of the spirit. And, and how, how are we to, uh, to develop this, this goodness, this integrity by the word of God? This too is a foundational text here in Micah chapter six, verse number eight, the Bible says, and he had shewed the old man and notice he says, what is good? See, it's God who shows us what is good. It's God who shows us what it is that we need to do in order to be people of integrity. And what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly before thy God? Can I just say this? And I know I have some, some husbands here. Husbands, you cannot be a good husband and uh, uh, those of you who are, are adult men, you cannot be a good man. You cannot be a good neighbor. You cannot be a good young person, young man, apart from the word of God. You need the word of God in order for you to develop and become all that God would like for you to become. Outside of the Bible, it's basically impossible for you to develop the way the Lord wants you to develop. There's a, there's a program that comes on Saturdays. It's called Ranger Bill. How many of you ever listened to that? You know, I've been listening to Ranger Bill for over 20, 24, no, for, for, for almost 30 years. I've been listening to Ranger Bill. You said, preacher, you're a grown man. Yes, yes. But, but in, that, in that Ranger Bill that comes on VCY, I mean, there are many principles that are brought out in, in, that, in the story of Ranger Bill. But, but Ranger Bill, while that is about a man who became a ranger, but more than that, it talks about his Christian character. And, and you see, as, as people uh, of the book, uh, just like I believe, even as he speaks, he sometimes quote passages out of the Bible. Now, how could he do that? He can do that because he's a student of the Bible and he's allowed the word of God to help develop him into becoming the best ranger that he could become. In the midst here, you, you young, you boys here, uh, you know, I don't know what God has planned for you. 
you know, not all of you will become preachers, which is obvious. But you know what? You may become a lawyer. You may become a construction worker. You may become an architect. You may become a doctor. You may become a, I don't know, a, a civil engineer. You may become a the next mayor of Kenosha, Wisconsin. You may become a, a city judge. I don't know. But what I do know is this. Whatever it is that God has chosen for you to become, you're going to need this book to help you to be successful. You're going to need God's word. Now, is that to say that that all lawyers and doctors and architects and judges and mayors and all of these guys are? Is that to say that they all uh, have walked in the way of God's word? No. And you can tell by the way they conduct themselves and the decisions that they make and the city suffers because of it. But what I am saying is this, which is very, very important. You need the word of God in your life to help develop you into what God wants you to be. So we understand that his goodness is developed through the word of God. Number two, his goodness is cultivated through godly fellowship, godly fellowship. And I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter number 10, Hebrews chapter 10. I've benefited from this principle here. In the 30 plus years that I have been saved, I've benefited greatly from this principle. Here in Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 24, the Bible says, and let us, you and I, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Good works. The spirit of the fruit of the spirit is goodness. Good works. Now, what does this mean, this thing about provoking? I've had the privilege of spending time in my tenure as a Christian around other people that have helped sharpen me to become the person I am today. I mean, I, could, I tell people you can easily... At the drop of a hat, I can easily run back to the world and I can be like Satan at any moment in time in history. But the joy that I have in knowing Christ was that God put people in my life that have provoked me unto good works, have provoked me unto love. And this is a wonderful thing. You see, one of the great hindrances in the life of men and boys is the people that you fellowship with. You have to make sure that you fellowship with the right people. Amen? And, and when you fellowship, Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20, he that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. The person that you walk with, that you call your friend, you better be careful. You better make, first of all, make sure that they're born again. And I'm not talking about just, they say, well, I'm born again because they're in church. You know, you know in your heart whether or not your friend is a Christian. You know that. There's no doubt about it. You know that. Now, whether you choose to fellowship with that person or spend time with that person is entirely up to you. But remember this, if you hang out with somebody that's not a Christian, they're going to cultivate you. They're going to push their agenda on you and you're going to start acting just like them. Now, when you do that, you're going to find yourself in a heap of trouble. A British, a British publisher or a British publication once offered a prize for the best definition of a friend. Among the thousands of people who sent in their answers to this British publication, these were some of the remarks that they received. It's one of them was uh, uh, in there, you know, what is your definition of a friend? One said, uh, one who multiplies joys, divides grief, and whose honesty is unbreakable. Then here's another one. Uh, someone said, my definition of a friend is, is one who understands my silence. And here's another definition. Uh, a friend is, is one, who, uh, uh, one who, who's like a watch who beats true 
at all times and never runs down. I like that one. Okay. Well, the one that they picked was this one. A friend is one who comes in when the whole world has gone out. When the whole world has gone out. I like that one. The person who's a friend is the one that sticks by you when no one else will stick by you. When no one else will, will, will uh, uh, be able to, uh, uh, to, to be there, this person is your friend. And by the grace of God, they'll have Christian character, Christian character. And so when a person displays the spirit of goodness or integrity, uh, they will encourage or be encouraged unto good work. So God's goodness is cultivated through fellowship, godly fellowship. God's goodness is developed through the word of God. And then lastly, God's goodness is revealed through our walk with Jesus Christ, through our walk with Jesus Christ. You know, Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verse 8, it says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And then it says, For we are his workmanship, we are his workmanship created unto Christ Jesus, unto good works, unto good works. We are put in a position where people ought to see Christ in us by our walk, by the good deeds that we do by our integrity. Jesus is simply saying, when Jesus says this in Matthew chapter five, verse 16, Jesus says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father, which is in heaven. Uh, Jesus reminds us that no matter where we go, we need to be shining the light of Christ. Uh, whether we go to the grocery store, whether we go to the hardware store, whether we go uh, to, uh, to the mall, whether we go to pay bills, people are to see Christ in us. That way, God will get the glory out of that. And so how can we become men of integrity? How can we display goodness? By realizing our inability to produce God's goodness in us. By relying on the Holy Spirit to produce it in us. And by revealing uh, in us uh, uh, through others, others that we learn from others how we can be people and men of integrity. Now, in closing, when we walk in integrity, we walk in a way where our word is, is we are doers of the word. Three things are going to happen. I like this. Three things. Number one, it will bring us protection. It will bring us protection. When you're an honest person, I believe that God works in the arena of honesty. I want you to turn with me to Psalm 25, 21. Psalm 25, 21. You know, the next time you're tempted to lie, what you need to do is ask the Lord to help you to, uh, to put on the, the spirit of integrity. The spirit of integrity, the fruit of the spirit the, uh, is goodness or integrity. Psalm 25, look at uh, verse number 21, verse 21. It says this, it says, let integrity and uprightness preserve me for I wait on thee. When you walk in integrity, it has a sense of preserving you or protecting you. We all need God's protection. You know what? I'm just in the in the of the mindset that when we are not people of integrity, uh, and, and I'm not saying that this is the way it is, but I sometimes wonder if God says, okay, you don't you don't want to be an honest person, then because of that, I'm going to allow this to come into your life to shake you up. Amen. But I want to be known as, a, as an honest person. Uh, I want to be known as a man of integrity. Number two, it will keep us on the straight and narrow. When we walk in integrity, it helps to keep us on the straight and narrow. Turn to Proverbs chapter 11. Proverbs chapter 11. And remember, uh, guys, this is something that we need to work on. You say, well, I am an honest man. Is that right? You say that, that, that you know, I, I do what I say I'm going to do. Is that right? Is that right? Amen. Can I say this to you? Don't kid yourself. Amen. Uh, uh, don't, don't, don't. Uh, uh, you know, we're in God's house. Don't 
Uh, don't insult my intelligence, what little bit I have like that. Amen. Uh, I think if we all were to be honest, amen, I think that we would have to say that we slip occasionally in the area of integrity. Amen. Here in Proverbs chapter 3, or chapter 11, verse number 3, it says, The integrity of the upright shall guide him, shall guide him. But the perverseness of transgressors shall destroy them, shall destroy them. When we step out of the arena of our integrity and we open ourselves up to follow after perverse things, God says we're going to be destroyed because of it. But as long as we walk in integrity, that has a sense of keeping us on the straight and narrow. And then there's this last one, and oh, I like this one. Not, not for my sake and not for your sake, but for your children's sake. This last one here is when we walk in integrity, it provides a heritage of blessings for our children. It provides a heritage of blessings for our children when we as men walk in integrity. Let me show this to you. I want you to turn to Proverbs chapter 21 or chapter 20. Proverbs chapter 20. So this is this is one of those, you know, we talk about generational curses. Well, this is a generational blessing. If you want your kids to to uh, to able to to benefit uh, from the blessings uh, that you've enjoyed in your life, then you need to be a man of integrity, a man of honesty, a man of goodness. Proverbs chapter 20, look at verse number seven. The Bible says, the just man walketh in his integrity. His children are blessed after him. Isn't that a wonderful promise? Amen. When we are honest, when we are doers of what we say we are going to do, when we walk in our integrity, our children will be blessed. It was said that Michael Angelo, uh, he painted uh, a beautiful mural in what's called the 16th Chapel. And he dedicated so much time in painting this mural on, in, on the ceiling and, and I think this, uh, this, this, uh, uh, this ceiling, I, I think, was over 20 feet tall uh, from the floor all the way up higher than that. And so Michelangelo devoted so much time to this mural, and then finally he was finished. But a lot of the, a lot of the ways in which he painted, he painted on his back. So he laid on scaffolding, and, and he painted just like this. And... And, and he was very, very efficient concerning the, the intricacies and the delicateness of, of this mural. And, 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 and so he finally was finished. One person, a reporter, walked, walked up to him and, and, and asked the question. He said, uh, uh, Mr. Angela, why did you devote so much time to painting that mural? He says, well, I, I wanted to leave a lasting legacy for other people. And then the fella asked this question. He said, uh, why did you, why were you so meticulous to every minute detail? He says, after all, Mr. Angelo, you know, from, from 20 feet, when we look up there, you know, we won't be able to tell or, or see the intricacy that, that, that you invested in. And then Michelangelo said, well, he said, but, but I will. I will. And, and you see, that illustration reminds us of the need to be men of integrity, to pay close attention to the little details, the little intricate parts. You know, somebody says, well, what, what time did you get off from work? And, and you know, you got off from work at, at 5.15 when you're supposed to get off at 5.30. What time did you get off from work? Uh, I, I got off at, at 5.30. Well, you prove yourself not to be a man of, of uh, what word am I looking for? Integrity. Amen. Just trying to see if you're paying attention. Amen. And, and you know, it's, it's just those little things. But remember, the Holy Spirit has to work on us, right? Because this is 
One of the gifts of the Spirit, the Spirit of goodness. Another name, the Spirit of goodness, another name for that is integrity. Is integrity. All right, let's go to the Lord. Father, we, we thank you, God, for this simple, simple lesson. And Lord, while when we look at the word goodness, we understand the Bible said that Jesus went about doing good. And, and we, we can look at that, obviously, from the standpoint, God, that he was able to heal the sick. He was able to restore blinded eyes and God provide hearing to deaf ears. And yes, Lord, he was able to raise the dead. And, and yes, he went about doing good. But, but God, we oftentimes overlook that Jesus also was a man of integrity. Lord, what he said that he would do, was going to do, he did. And Lord, help us. God, to develop this fruit of the Spirit in our own lives. God, help us to be men of integrity, men, young men of honesty. God, Lord, not just so that we can straight, stay on the straight and narrow, and, and Lord, not so that we can enjoy your protection, but Lord, so that our children and even our children's children might reap, Lord, the, the benefits of the blessings because they had a dad uh, or they had a grandfather that was willing, Lord, uh, to be honest before you bless our services today. May Christ uh, be exalted uh, in the message this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.